We'll see. <laughs> okay, well, welcome to today's Ecology Center lecture. And I'm excited to be able to introduce Dr. Karen Hall. Um, and I wrote this, I wrote out, usually I don't do this, I just wing it, but I was afraid I would go on too long if I didn't write something out because there's enough good things to say about Karen. So basically, you know, she studies what keeps ecosystems from recovering after anthropogenic disturbance and then uses that information to propose improved restoration approaches. And she does this, one of the things that's interesting is she does this in a bunch of environmental contexts. So she's probably best known for her work in Latin America, um, but she's, and that's what she spoke about yesterday, but she's working in California coastal prairies and riparian areas of, of California. And, and most pertinent to today's talk, she's also been studying how to improve the success of all these large tree growing campaigns that are so prominent today. So uh, some credentials, Dr. Hull is the author of a influential new textbook, which I think is cool because it's being translated into Spanish, Portuguese, Chinese, and Persian. Um, she has received lots of honors. She's a fellow of the California Academy of Sciences, the Ecological Society of America. She was an Aldo Leopold Leadership Fellow, which I think is really important because this is a program that helps outstanding scientists learn new ways to connect their science with practitioners, with policy makers, and with the public. And so um, when Gino and Kari and I wrote the Ecology Center nomination, we wrote, she is frankly one of the most influential and innovative restoration ecologists in the world. And we are lucky to be able to hear from her today. So thanks for being here, particularly those of you who are back after yesterday for round two. Um, yesterday, I focused more on restoration. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, large scale tree planting initiatives, which wasn't necessarily something I planned to get into in, into my career. It's sort of something that I have happened upon, but has consumed a lot of my time in the last two years because of how much it has sort of obsessed the entire world um, about planting trees of late. And this is work that I largely have done with my collaborator, Pedro Brancaleone, who's at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Um, and uh, we, we sort of got started in this because in 2017, we were driving around Brazil and we were talking about, oh, we really need to write this paper about tree planting is not a panacea, about what you can and can't, um, what, what you can and can't say about tree, what you can achieve with tree planting. And we were busy like all scientists. And so we didn't actually get around to doing it until this big paper came out in science in 2019 that pretty much said, we're gonna um, plant our way out of climate change. And Pedro and I are on email going, we need to write the paper now. Um, so that kind of started this whole ca category of like what was getting really involved in this, which has, like I said, taken a lot of my time in the last two years. So um, what am I talking about? So there's there's many forest restoration and tree planting campaigns. And I talk more about forest restoration to talk about the tree planting campaigns. There are at least three trillion tree planting campaigns globally. One is from the World Economic Forum. Another one is Plant for the Planet. And the other one, the Trillion Trees one, is a, a com combination of World Wildlife Conservation Society, World Wildlife Fund, and BirdLife. And those are underlain by billion and million tree planting campaigns in various places over the world. The tree tsunami is in uh, Pakistan. Okay, we're gonna get the laser pointer to work today. There we go, okay. Pakistan, um, this is one from New Zealand. This is one from Canada. So there are all these different campaigns. And if you go on the internet, it's pretty hard to not at some point or other have it pop up on your web saying, oh, you can, if you give us $1, you can plant a tree. So why is there this global obsession with tree planting? Well, I think it's pretty um, clear why. We're getting these messages, bad news every day. I just picked these from recent coming up to COP and sort of timely for this talk because we're at the, sort of the end of COP. You know, we get these messages that climate chaos is happening. We need more ambitious climate plans. Um, we also get the same question about biodiversity and uh, a little less known in, in December, there's gonna be COP 15 about biodiversity and we're losing our humanities. And so everybody is getting this negative message. And then all of a sudden you start seeing these headlines everywhere saying that we are going to, um, tree planting has mind blowing potential to the climate crisis. And so here we have the solution. It's coming from politicians, it's coming from scientists, it's coming from YouTubers, business people, everybody has jumped on the bandwagon. We can plant trees, 
And it is like the greatest thing since sliced cheese. You get like, you know, you can get biodiversity, you can get carbon, you can solve, you know, employment problems and all these things. But then what started happening after this, you had this run of people talking about everything we can do with trees, you start the critique. And so people start saying like, well, maybe it's not quite as simple as that. And that's where this paper with Pedro that we wrote and it was published in Science in 2020 was, um, since it was published during the pandemic, science didn't like our title of tree planting is not a panacea. So they made us change the title to tree planting is not a simple solution. Um, but so sort of saying like, we need to be really more realistic about what we can achieve with tree planting. So what is the critique? Um, sort of in simple, we can get a lot of benefits from tree planting. And just some of them are, we can get um, enhanced water and carbon storage, increased landscape connectivity and native biodiversity. Um, we can also, if it's done right, you can engage stakeholders, you can enhance, enhance human livelihoods and get a lot of things. But then there's all these examples of a lot of unintended consequences. So there's some really good examples of very large areas that have been planted with trees in places like the Intermountain West, um, particularly in China, there's very well documented where they planted trees into arid areas and it's actually reduced water supply. A lot of concern from the grassland community in the world that you're planting into areas that were never had trees before. And so you're doing what's called afforestation and reforestation. Um, and so you're destroying uh, grasslands which are also very threatened habitats. And then you have these cases where there's social conflicts because of the tree planting, because a lot of times there's people in this land where you're going to plant trees. And then one of the worst possible things is sort of displacing farmland. And so you're saying, okay, I'm gonna plant trees in this area, take people out of farming, and then they're going to go clear forest elsewhere to get those resources. And that's pretty much the worst thing you could be doing because then you're destroying intact forest. So, um, there's a ton of, and the other thing is there's a lot of examples of tree planting failures. And some of these tree planting failures happen um, as a result of just poor planting where you go out and you plant these trees and they're planted and they aren't irrigated, they're planted in the wrong climate and things like that. In the worst cases, you also have a lot of social conflicts where there's like land um, ownership disputes and you have people, you know, top down efforts where then people are um, pulling out the trees because they don't really want the trees planted there. And so there's, I would say, probably more failures than I would say successes in these really large scale tree planting efforts or there have been to, to date. So I like to, um, because of some of my writings, sometimes when I'm talking to reporters and they seem to think that I'm against tree planting, I am not. Um, I just think that if we're going to do it, we have to improve it. And I've been trying to change the narrative from tree planting to tree growing. And the reason I call it tree growing is for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, there's a big obsession with how many trees we put in the ground. And that's what they're counting is how many trees you put in the ground. But we all know that if we wanna get the benefits like carbon and, um, and biodiversity, those trees have to grow over time. It's not just about putting them in the ground. Um, the other reason is you don't necessarily have to plant a tree to grow a tree. And so a lot of trees actually regenerate on their own. And sometimes the best way to grow trees is not to actually plant them. It is to allow the ecosystem to regenerate naturally as I talked about some in my talk yesterday. And I also think that tree growing, it's not a point, it's a process. And so we really need to think about it as such. And tree growing is one of many natural climate solutions. There's other ones like such as, you know, wetland and mangrove restoration, um, a lot of focus on wetlands because of their carbon sequestration potential. There's also a lot of different examples of agroforestry and improved grazing management, things like that. And so it's sort of one of these parts of these types of either natural climate solutions, nature-based solutions, things like that as to ways to take up carbon. So there's sort of three key points that I make when I talk with reporters about tree growing. First of all, tree growing is not a substitute for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We are not going to plant our way out of climate change. And this is a, a picture that came sort of out of the, one of the latest IPCC reports. And you can see, you know, land-based restoration definitely has a part in this. Um, you know, it is definitely one of the solutions, but it is one tool in the toolbox. An analogy one of my colleagues, Susan Cook Patton uses is you need a hammer to build a house, but you cannot build a house with a hammer alone. We are gonna be have to address the carbon issues every possible way we can. And tree growing is one of them, but we really have to reduce emissions. We have to think about other ways that we can sequester carbon. And so really at this point, everything needs to be on the table. The other problem about with climate change is 
um, it's a really good paper by Bill Anderig from University of Utah. So looking at the fact of the permanence of the carbon. And we know that you know, we are burning carbon that has been in the ground for millennia, and we're putting it into above ground carbon, which is very susceptible. And as we all know, well in the Western United States to fire, to insects, and it's not necessarily very permanent. And so that's the other reason that it's not a substitute for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The second point is that we need to reduce the drivers of deforestation. Um, the most important thing to do, I'm a restoration ecologist, but I'll be the first person to say that it is much better to protect intact ecosystems because it is extremely hard to recreate those ecosystems. And we really can't even really do it. We do the best that we can. And so I find it that, you know, it's in the political eyes, you know, ironic, like when we're talking about, okay, we're gonna log the Tongass forest under Trump was talking about that but it's okay to, we're gonna plant trees. And we see the same dynamic in Brazil with, where there's a lot of restoration going on in the Atlantic forest, but we, the highest priority should definitely be protecting the Amazon. And so that has to be the first priority. And so that means reducing the drivers of deforestation. And I think this is a place where we can really, as scientists be working and thinking about that, you know, thinking about um, in some of the biggest tropical forest drivers are things like beef, timber, and particularly oil, palm, and soy, and thinking about the food, the, um, the supply chain and where we're getting these from and our consumption patterns and what's causing deforestation and really addressing those. Um, one other, unfortunately, um, driver in a smaller scale is some of these very poorly incentivized tree growing programs. And so there's some example of poorly planned tree planting programs where it's actually causing deforestation. And one example, there's been some concern about Mexico's tree planting programs where they pay farmers to plant trees. And so the farmers are actually cutting down trees and then going in and planting trees. Um, and so you, that's really not what you wanna be doing. And that's where we need to be thinking about how to get the incentives right. And the final thing is that we really need to improve tree growing outcomes. And this is where I've been trying to sort of push um, in the last couple of years and work with conservation organizations to think about how do we do this better? And that means thinking about why we're planting trees. And um, that came up a little bit in yesterday's seminar is really making our goals clear. Where we're planting and trying to think about planting in places that probably aren't the most productive land for other land uses. And also thinking about how we plant trees um, or how we grow trees, um, because there's a lot of different approaches to do that, depending on the reason why we're doing it in the first place. So people grow trees for many different reasons. And again, somebody asked about this yesterday. Um, we want obviously a big reason um, in the motivation right now is sequestering carbon. Um, as we know around here, you know, preventing erosion after forest, uh, after fires. Um, as a restoration ecologist, I'm focused a lot on conserving biodiversity and restoring forests, but there's a lot of efforts to provide shade, to practice agroforestry and to earn money. And so there's just lots of different reason that people plant and grow trees. And a really interesting article that came out last year by Meredith Martin at North Carolina State, they really looked at, they surveyed about 300 different conservation organizations that were planting trees, like why they were doing it. And surprisingly, they found that people plant trees mostly for utility. So most of the trees that are being planted, these organizations are either for timber or for food crops and not as much actually for carbon and very little, I would say, for biodiversity. And so, that was really interesting to me. Um, you know, I knew that not many people were planting for biodiversity, but I thought more people were planting for carbon and that may be changing over time. But the key point here is that there are trade-offs. And so, you know, you can't, people sort of, it's sort of this like, you know, kumbaya, we're gonna do all these things with tree planting and not every project can hit all these goals. And so we really need to be clear about why we're planting trees. And as an example of some of these, conflicting goals, and also as an example of sort of how it, there's different goals at different levels of organization. Um, this is an example that Pedro and I used in our paper about the Brazilian Atlantic Forest. And um, in the Brazilian Atlantic Forest, they're doing a lot of restoration at a very large scale and doing some really interesting practices, um, some of which I talked about yesterday, and I'll talk a little bit more later in this talk. But why are they planting trees? Well, it depends on who you're asking, because at the global scale, um, you know, the country of Brazil has made an ND, a national defined with contribution like for climate change, they made their carbon commitment. There's also funding that comes in from organizations that are not only in carbon, but that are interested in biodiversity. At the national level, um, Brazil has a national forest code 
And a lot of the planning that's mandated there, they have a minimum forest cover that's supposed to be maintained. And that percentage depends on where you are in the country. It's higher when you get over towards the Amazon where there's more forest cover and it's at like 20% um, down in the, uh, in the Atlantic forest. Um, but it's motivated a lot by improving water quality. Um, and then, but the actual trees are planted on lands owned by farmers. And so if those farmers are planting, they're probably going to want to plant trees that provide food, firewood, and income. And so you can see that, you know, so the species that they might want for food or for firewood are not going to be, well, obviously, if they harvest the firewood, then it's not going to sequester carbon. But those might be different than the ones to conserve biodiversity. And so you can, I mean, you can get a lot of carbon with a very not biodiverse forest. I mean, you could go out and plant a bunch of um, you know, eucalyptus. And so if you want to hit multiple goals, you really have to write that into the plan to be able to get there. And one of the ways that Brazil and the Atlantic forest, and should have, yeah, so Atlantic forest is like the green area here along the coast here. And I should say the Atlantic forest was deforested 200 to 300 years ago in the Portuguese colony. So that's why the focus there is on restoration, whereas in other areas of the country, there the higher priority is protecting intact forest. Um, what they've done is they have the Atlantic Forest Pact, which is a group of about 300 organizations and it includes academic institutions, restorationists, some of the government agencies, um, various other um, groups that are involved. And they've all come together in this pact and they spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, best practices, monitoring regimes. They've developed this monitoring protocol that's used pretty much now Brazil wide. And so working together. And I think that um, one of the goals and one of the things you probably need more is some of these regional organizations that are kind of working across the divide from the very local to the global in trying to coordinate, you know, why restoration is done. And, and obviously it's going to be a mosaic across the areas. So um, one of the, so what, what do we need to do better? Well, first of all, as I said, we need to clearly define and agree on project goals amongst different groups. We need to integrate decision making across scales. And this requires a pretty long, you know, going through an inclusive planning process to tailor tree growing strategies to the project goals. And so choosing methods that are going to fit the project goals. And this is obviously takes more time. It's more expensive and it's challenging. It's not, it's not a simple solution. So some of the questions that need to be addressed in the process. Um, what, first of all, what is the most appropriate strategy for growing trees? And amongst that is like whether you even need to plant trees at all. And as I said earlier on, the most cost effective and ecologically sound method of growing trees in a lot of cases is to just allow natural recovery to happen. We know that you know if you restore, and, and as I was talking about research yesterday, a lot of that work has been about trying to figure out how we facilitate the natural recovery processes. Um, and we also know that after disturbances that you do have a lot of sites that regenerate a lot, particularly in areas that re-sprout from roots in which the land use has not been used really heavily. Um, we also know that like, this is out where I live in California, where I was evacuated for fire, and people will come up to me and say, oh, should we go replant after fire? But we know that the redwoods re-sprout pretty well, and so really it's not a great use of resources to go out and plant, and then you have to think about the genetics and all those types of things. And so if possible, using the natural processes makes a lot of sense. So the way I look at it is sort of a continuum of tree growing approaches. At one end, you have natural regeneration, which may make sense in some areas where natural regeneration happens quickly enough, where it's compatible with the goals. Other cases, using assisted natural regeneration, which is sort of letting the system recover, but then intervening. And so what that might look like in tropical systems is clearing around the recruits that have established to allow those to grow more quickly. Um, this is an, another example out where I live in California, where this is actually a controlled burn. A lot of this regenerated. This is more shrubland, and it's a sandy soil habitat. But there are patches that didn't recover as well. So perhaps just seeding or planting in the areas that don't recover quite as well, rather than planting the whole area. Oftentimes, planting along waterways. Of course, there are cases where you know it's pretty degraded land, and you might want to do more mixed species plantings. Other, in other cases, there's a lot of tree growing that's done that's part of agroforestry systems. And that's gonna take a different approach and you do wanna plant, actually plant the trees there because there's certain species that you want in the system. And then you have monoculture tree plantations for timber. And that's not what I study as a restoration ecologist, but obviously we have to provide uh, wood, pulp wood and timber to people. And so in some cases that's the right strategy. And so 
there's not a one size fits all. The most appropriate strategy depends on local ecological and social conditions and on the project goals. Okay. So some of the other questions that we have to address, um, what is the most appropriate strategy after that is land tenure. Land tenure is one of the biggest issues in making sure that tenure is secure because if it's not, then people don't have a lot of, uh, they don't have a lot of incentive to invest in a long-term process like growing trees. And how will the landowners be compensated for lost income? A lot of the global tree planting that's being proposed is in the global south and in countries where, in low-income countries where people do earn money off the land or they use it agriculturally. And so if you're asking them not to use the land, then the question is, how are they going to be compensated for, um, for sequestering carbon? And one of the biggest questions for me too is not just who will put the money in the ground, but who's going to pay for the cost of like, fencing the land, caring for, for monitoring the trees, protecting the site, um, and who's responsible for doing all the above tasks. And this doesn't get budgeted into a lot of these projects. And so people will say, you know, can you plant, can you plant a tree for a dollar? Well, you might be able to plant a tree for a dollar, but in my opinion, you can't grow a tree for a dollar because it takes a lot longer and you have to be, have this long-term commitment to maintaining it and also to um, compensate the landowners. So for me, one of the biggest issues is, like, as I said, planning for permanence. And so I'd rather see us in these sort of targets and rather saying like, okay, we're going to plant a trillion trees. It'd be like, well, let's have, you know, 200 billion trees that are alive in 10 years or in 20 years and setting targets that are farther out, just not the trees put in the ground. And why am I so concerned about that? Well, part of it is that we know that despite all these massive tree planting efforts, in most areas in the world, forest cover is continuing to go down. There are areas like in China here where um, they've done massive tree planting. And so the forest cover is actually going up, um, but most areas it's still going down. And there's all this land that, there's land that people go, oh yes, this land is no longer being used and it's regenerating and there's second growth. But one of the things that we're starting to realize is people started doing GIS analyses. And so one of the first ones was by some of my colleagues in, in Costa Rica and realizing that a lot of the land gets re-cleared, like it goes into secondary forest and people say the forest is growing back, but that a lot of it doesn't actually last more than about 20 years. And so they had the study in 2019 that came out in Costa Rica. Then um, this crowd, Mitch Age Group, they started realizing the same thing was happening across all of Latin America. And this came out this year in 2022, people looking all over the world that a lot of this forest that's coming back um, or has been replanting, it doesn't last that long. And so we really need to be thinking about, you know, how can we make sure that the lands stay, that, that these lands that are, look like they're going back to forest, they actually stay there on the landscape. And to do that, we have to think about, you know, as I said, stakeholders are engaged in the process, um, selecting species that are likely to survive in future climate conditions, really thinking about this question of funding maintenance, monitoring, and adaptive management, and also thinking about, as I said, selecting lands that may be less productive for agriculture or other usage because they're much more likely to be maintained in tree cover over time. So one of the studies, I thought this was pretty interesting, and it, there's been a lot of mapping efforts of like, where do we put trees? This is by um, Susan Cook-Patton at TNC and her colleagues. And they really looked at where some of the best, most promising places were to do reforestation in the United States. And what I liked about the study was a couple of things. Was first of all, they um, really looked at different ways, places that might make sense to, um, to do reforestation over time. And they also didn't just map it on using geographic, you know, GIS methods, remote sensing. They also went in and they talked to practitioners and they said, do you really think this is feasible? What would it cost? And sort of looked at this and ground truth, whether this made sense. And so they looked at areas, things like reforesting and protected areas, because obviously those aren't probably as likely to be reconverted. Post burn landscapes, areas where they're challenging soil conditions or frequently flooded areas so that those are areas that are less likely to be valuable for agriculture over the long term. And then there's also some areas where there's potentials in urban open spaces. And you can see from the maps, realizing that the types of areas you might be planting into are areas that really vary regionally where the opportunities lie. And so thinking in that sense. So I found that was to be a really interesting study. I think also we have to be thinking about solutions that are win-wins socially and um, ecologically, and this often means thinking outside the box somewhat. 
And just a couple of examples. Yes. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you. Um, so the darker the colors are, um, they're they're better they're better they're better places to do it. So like we have more protected areas out in the western United States, um, post burn landscapes obviously, and then some of these places like in the eastern, there seem to be some urban opportunities frequently flooded and things like that. But thank you. Yes, and if I do anything else like that, feel free to stop me. Um, <laughs> thanks, Lenny. Okay. Um, okay. So just a couple of examples of case studies of opportunities that I think are sort of some of these types of win-win. Um, one of the things that's been done um, in some of the South American countries is using silvopastoral systems. And silvopastoral systems are systems that combine uh, cattle grazing with and, and improving the quality of the habitat and the amount of shrub and tree cover within the landscapes. And so they go and they plant trees and shrubs in those landscapes and then you're improving the landscape for wildlife. It also turns out that it actually also improves the cattle, the dairy quality of the milk and things like that. And also the farmers seem to, it seems to be more resilient to climate change too. So doing that, um, one of my former graduate students, Alicia Calle, did a bunch of work in, coast, in, sorry, in Colombia, she is Colombian, looking at how well these system works. And so the idea here with these is that you try to increase the productivity and the profitability of cattle grazing in the productive areas by planting more trees in the landscape and also maintaining like riparian areas. And if you do that, then what you can do is you can then hopefully facilitate the release of agricultural lands in more marginal and steep areas like that. And so she, her dissertation looked at, it was a really interesting system where farmers were paid uh, payments for environmental services for three years to transition them from moving we're using sort of standard cattle grazing methods to more civil pastoral systems because it is costly to transition. You have to fence your land more. You have to go out and plant the trees. Sometimes you have to protect the trees while they're doing that. But she actually found, and then she went back 10 years later and looked at, even though they hadn't been um, getting payments, had the forest cover increased. And what she did found was that, first of all, the farmers saw the benefits of it. And she compared the forest cover in payment farms and non-payment farms and found that there was actually an increase in tree cover in all farms, but it was higher in the farms that got payments. And so looking at win-wins like this, where there are benefits to the farmers and you're also, you're, they're, they're getting an in income off the land um, at the same time as they're also increasing tree cover. Some other creative solutions, and I talked a little bit about this yesterday, um, is my colleague, Pedro Brancaglio in Brazil, who very much is thinking about how are we going to pay for restoration and how are we going to scale it up? And so he has these massive experiments um, looking at different intercropping of eucalypts as a, um, with different densities of native species with the idea that I mentioned yesterday that you grow the eucalypts for a few years and then you log them out and looking at um, you know, how it can be used as an intermediate source and uh, of income to, to cover the cost of reforestation. And I, as a Californian, I have to say, I was a bit horrified when I first went there and he suggested planting eucalypts because eucalypts in California, there's nothing in the understory, but it's a really different system. And so you can see here, this is eucalypts here, and you have a really diverse understory um, established underneath these unmanaged eucalypts. And he actually thinks that you could, um, you could actually have a double carbon layer. You could have the understory of the, um, of the native species and then have the carbon in the eucalypts overstory. And just really trying to think about how we can do this creatively um, this is actually a park when I was there earlier um, this year that's owned by Susano, which is the largest eucalyptus, uh, the largest paper pulp producer in Brazil. They own like 2 million hectares of land. And so he's actually been working with them on different strategies. I mean, obviously they're going to keep growing eucalyptus because that's where they get income, but trying to, um, trying to um, come up with ways that on parts of their land, they're doing reforestation with native species. And this is an area where they went in and they actually killed the eucalyptus in the overstory and they've made this sort of private park there. And you can see it's a quite diverse tropical forest that is established below the eucalyptus. He's also been working a lot with thinking about these questions of where do we prioritize lands to try to pick areas that are less productive and try to target those areas to either you know, get the lands protected, to buy them out, and then having other areas that you can use for more productive uses. And so I think these are the types of case things that we have to think about when we, if we are going to grow trees over the long term, is how do they, you know, do how do we find win-win situations? 
And if you're interested in some of the work that he's doing in Brazil, um, there was actually the whole May issue of National Geographic was focused on forests, and they have a whole article on some of the stuff that he's been doing there. So that leads me into sort of a little bit of like, where am I going now with some of this work? Um, so after I had my 2020 paper, um, it, uh, what happened was is I started to get called by reporters and I got called a lot by reporters. Um, I've talked to pretty much a lot of the really major news outlets about this, you know, and this is things like the Wall Street Journal and I get another call and I'm like, haven't everybody written an article about tree planting? It sort of feels like everybody's done that. But so the, they start calling, and then after I get quoted in those those types of uh, uh, journals or bag, you know, public media type things, then I start getting called, and I get a lot of people calling me, and what they um, different groups that are trying to do carbon offsets, and this includes a lot of conservation organizations and people who have been in the business. But one of the things that's happening with all this like huge focus on tree planting is that there are tons of new people and there's new people every single day getting into it. And some of these groups are business people who have zero scientific knowledge and they just want to, they, they've actually, they try to like, are you available to like hire it out? And I'm like, no, I really have a job. Um, I, I'm not looking to do this, but there's a question that I get asked by both these groups is which tree growing projects should we support? And so everybody wants a really simple answer of like, okay, who should we give our money to? Um, and they would like me to tell you that you can do it for a dollar a tree, which I'm not really willing to do. So it's sort of, as a scientist, it's hard because are you gonna start advocating for certain groups and without really the information that you have? So the first thing that Pedro and I started doing because we got asked this question so often was to try to come up with sort of a framework of the questions that you should be asking um, of the groups before you fund them. And so, um, and some of the things, and when I was asked to be on the advisory boards for some of these groups, which I, which I have done some of this, they weren't giving me the information I needed. They would be coming and they go, oh, these people are like planting these fruit trees and it sounds great. And they say they're engaging the local community, but in a lot of cases, they just haven't really, I kept saying, well, have the initial drivers of deforestation been addressed? And they're like, well, we don't know. Um, and so the first set of questions we have, I won't go into in a lot of detail because these are the same questions I just talked about that I think we need to be asking, you know, what the goal is, um, how are they, do, are they the right strategies to match those goals? You know, things like how will the project be maintained and supported after the first few years, which very few projects address. Um, but another really big one that I focus on a lot, and I've talked to a few people during my stay here, is what what's the monitoring that's being done? And when I sat on, um, I reviewed a bunch of projects for the um, World Economic Forum and Trillion Tree groups. And the groups that made it to the finals, like I was asking every single group, how long are you monitoring? And the longest was two years. And that's kind of shocking. Like they're putting tons of money into this and they don't even know, you know, like what's happening. So as we looked at the landscape, the other question that we, I've been really thinking about with the money is that we realized that there's kind of two types of groups when these groups are collecting money for their tree growing projects or tree planting projects, most cases, um, a lot of it's coming, I mean, there's certain government agencies and private companies that are doing it on their own land. But when the money is coming from private funds, it goes to two types of organizations. Um, there's intermediary organizations, which are mostly international NGOs. And what they're doing is they're kind of advertising, they're usually the ones with the flashy websites, they're collecting the money, and then they're giving it to these local implementing groups on the ground who are actually the people who are planting the trees. And there are some groups that do both of this, but you can think of like who these people are, like Plant for the Planet. Plant for the Planet itself does have some projects, but they're really funding, the, they're sending the money to other local organizations. So um, one of the big questions that I've been asking of some of these is, um, first of all, you need to be asking like, what are the outcomes of prior tree growing efforts of these groups? Because as I said, they're coming on the, the new people come in every day into this. Um, there's this one terraformation and the, the leader of the founder of it is like, was a big, you know, in the Silicon Valley running like, I don't remember one of, one of the really big, whether it's LinkedIn or one of those but really big groups. And they're just like, they're getting into it. I talked to some guy, he had been working in like um, green vehicle batteries. Oh, now he's gonna go into tree growing, tree planting. So they just move around. So like, do they have any track record? And also how will the funding be allocated across organizational scales? Because I always wonder about the groups, they have tons of people in higher income countries who are managing it, which is taking a fair amount of money away from the, um, the local groups. And if you try to find their budget stuff on the website, it's really hard to come by. So these are sort of the questions that we started asking. So some of the work that I'm doing now, 
um, on this. First of all, we've um, one of my, my new postdoc, and then I have some undergrads who are in grad students who are working with me, is we've really been looking at evaluating how well the implementing organizations can answer the questions that we laid out. And this means a lot of like surfing their websites, looking at their annual reports, but is, and one of the things we're finding is like, they have very little information on monitoring, very little information on where all the finances are going. And so we are um, hoping to, in the next few months, kind of really do a full court press on this and then have this written up fairly soon. Um, it, Manga Bay, which is a um, sort of a news website, they started a lot of rainforest work. They're actually doing a bunch of, they have an app now where they're looking more at the implementing organization. So I've been in touch with them to kind of coordinate our efforts so that we aren't duplicating efforts. Another thing we've been doing is looking at some case studies. Um, I have an undergraduate student um, at Santa Cruz who's um, of Ethiopian heritage. So we got really interested in what was going on in Ethiopia. And Ethiopia got a lot of um, press about two years ago because they had this like, they set a world record. They planted 350 million trees in 12 hours. And the big question is, where are all those trees being planted? And so he started this project during COVID. So we were like, he was getting up in the middle of the night to have Zoom calls with people in Ethiopia. And finally last summer, he was able to go and talk to a lot of people. And the honest thing is that the government doesn't have any data on where they're planted. And some of the people he talked to even said that they knew that there were certain areas that were getting planted the same areas every year. And so like they put, they count those trees one year and then they go out and plant again the next year and it gets double counted. And so there's a lot of problems with some of the tracking in there. And so we've been trying to kind of get to the bottom of this one and um, hopefully we'll be writing up some results of that one. But it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a bit disheartening because so much effort is going into that. And the government is really committed to doing this tree planting, but really it's just not coordinated at all, you know, and it's not well planned. Um, another thing that I was involved in too, and one of the things uh, I've been involved in this working group through SUSINC, which is the National Center for Socio-Ecological Synthesis, is that there's a lot of mapping efforts. This was one that got really heavily critiqued by the World Research Institute, looking at like, where could we, uh, plant trees and you know, where is this reforestation potential? And a lot of these, and there's a lot of scientific articles too. And what they do is they sort of map areas where they, there's abandoned land um, and usually abandoned or there's potential land to be um, reforested. And usually abandoned land is categorized as like not having been used for agriculture for like two to five years. And so I was involved in this group with a bunch of forest economists and um, demographers. And so we really got thinking about this whole land tenure issue and what does abandoned, abandoned land mean? Because you can go out and you can, um, you can map areas that you know, from using GIS remote, remote sense work and say, okay, well, this has been abandoned for two years, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that area is going to actually be, um, is actually gonna be abandoned over the long term. It may be part of a shifting agricultural system it may be an area that's really not biophysically suitable for forest cover. And then you get into really complicated um, landholder rights issue. You know, is the person actually letting abandon it? Are they selling the land? Are there land grabs going on? And so it really made us think a lot about, you know, we think that the definition of abandoned land for these mapping, um, for these mapping efforts, really, I have some a lot of questions about them at the global scale because there's these complicated ownership issues that really have to be addressed. And so one of the things that we really recommend is thinking about not just mapping it, but also combining that with some surveys and interviews at the local level to figure out why are farmers abandoning land and figuring out whether this really is going to be permanent land. So one thing in that effort is, um, as I mentioned in Costa Rica, we discovered my um, former grad student, Leighton Reed and some other colleagues looked at in Southern Costa Rica about how long forest patches persisted there. And what they found was that, you know, by about 30 to 50 years out, you had less than about 20% persisting. And so one of the things we've been looking at is now my, um, one of my graduate students who also did some of the work I talked about yesterday, um, the social science portion of his dissertation is looking at land reversals in Costa Rica. And so what he's doing is looking at um, areas where there have been land reversals, and then he's gonna be going out in the next few months and actually interviewing the farmers to better understand the social dynamics underlying some of the changes in those reversals to try to figure out, you know, you have to understand why farmers are clearing their land to figure out how might we come up with incentives so that they don't do that, you know, so that they, um, we can maintain the forest cover on the landscape. So, um, so that's kind of, uh, what what I've been up to in my lab. I'd be happy to have questions, suggestions, and um, 
thanks uh, to MacArthur Foundation that has given me some funding for this work. So thank you very much.